right, good afternoon. Um, we'll go ahead and get started and we may have some others join us in a little while. Um, but I want to welcome you to Family Connections. Uh, this is a weekly online seminar that um, we have started for parents and guardians of Snyder ISD students. And uh, I'm Valerie Morris. I'm the public information officer here. And I'm joined by our panelists today who I'm going to introduce here in just a moment. Um, I want to let you know that if you want to submit a question at any time during the presentation, we encourage you to do so. Uh, we've had some questions submitted already, but if you have a question, you can just go and look below. You should see a chat option or a Q&A option. And if you click on that, you can type your question in there. If you're having trouble with that, you can always go the old fashioned way and just email questions at Snyder ISD and we'll be glad to answer that question. Myself and Jesus Gomez, who is also joining us, he is the Director of Equity, Inclusion and Diversity, and he is going to be joining me in moderating and watching those questions as they come in. And um, Jesus, would you like to talk a little bit about the um, translation services that are available right quick. Uh, yes, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce myself. Yes, as Valerie said, my name is Jesus Gomez. I am the Director of Equity, Inclusion and Diversity for Snyder ISD. Um, I, I am available to translate to Spanish, only, I'm only bilingual. So, uh, but este, si necesitan uh, servicios de interpretación al español, Este, con mucho gusto, aquí estamos para ayudarle y para poder proveer estos servicios y videos en español también. Thank you, Jesus. Um, I'm going to introduce our panelists. We have uh, Mr. Matthew Nelson, who's the Director of Special Services, and then we have Ms. Donita Nelson, who is one of our diagnosticians. I will turn it over to you all, and we will be watching for, for questions that come up. Okay. Well, uh, first, I, this is a great opportunity. I appreciate uh, having the ability to, to do this webinar and kind of talk about special services. Uh, sometimes the, the 504 special education uh, don't get a lot of uh, limelight. <laughs> so I'm, I'm happy that we have this opportunity to uh, spend a few minutes talking about our, our portion of Snyder ISD. Um, so the first question that we have is, um, my son goes to the high school and has a 504 for plan. I'm concerned that he's not progressing or doing well in class. I know teachers and classroom activities keep everyone busy, but we just want to make sure that he's getting the attention and assistance he needs to be successful. What can we do to help improve his academic opportunities and outcomes? That's a great question, and I'm sure a lot of other parents around the district have that question. Uh, there's probably a number of ways that you can attack that. Uh, first, I would suggest that the parent uh, schedule a, a parent teacher conference. Um, if, if it were me, I would want to sit down with that teacher with my son and I would want to talk through the challenges that he is having uh, in the courses that, that, that he's struggling with. That will give the, you know, the three of them the opportunity to kind of uh, uh, make sure that they've identified the problems. W what are the struggles that the student is having? It, uh, you know, in some cases it could be as simple as, hey, I can't hear the teacher. I can't see the board. Uh, you know, so things like that are, are simple fixes, but sometimes if you don't address the problem, if you don't identify the problem, you really don't know how to, to go about fixing it. Uh, so that'd be, but I, that'd be the first thing I would suggest is to have, have a parent teacher conference and just sit down with the teachers uh, where the student is struggling. And, and try to make sure that, we, that we've identified the problems that, that we may be having. Second step is if, if the student has a 504 plan and the parent or the student does not feel like it's, it's an effective plan or that it's, it's not doing what it needs to do to, to help the student be successful, uh, then I would contact the, the campus 504 coordinator and schedule a meeting with that individual, uh, sit down with the team. Typically that's, typically that's an administrator, uh, it's, it's a teacher who um, kind of serves as a case manager for the student and, and their, their 504 needs and plan. Uh, but you, you sit down again with, with those individuals and, and review the 504 plan, uh, talk about what's working, you know, what's not working, uh, what, are, what are the new challenges that, that may uh, result in a need for tweaking that plan. Uh, but that gives everybody again, an opportunity to kind of identify the problems and make sure that we're doing everything that we possibly can to, to help that student uh, be successful in his coursework. 
you have anything to add? Well, just to follow up that um, parents for both special ed and 504, um, parents have the right to request a meeting at any time. So if they need an ARD meeting, if their child is in special ed, or if they feel like they need a 504 meeting for their 504 student, they are within their rights to call an ARD meeting or a 504 meeting at any time. So um, if that's the case, then I would contact the campus so that um, you can get that meeting scheduled. Great. Um, let me ask you this because we've said 504 and um, a couple of other different terms. Um, what, what is special education? What, in, what is encompassed in that? And what's the difference between SPED and 504? Yeah, so uh, 504 is is a is kind of the, like the, the first step for a student uh, who has a disability, has an identified disability. There are certain criteria that uh, that help define when a student would be met, uh, would would have his needs met under a 504 plan, versus when a special education uh, IEP or individual education plan would be needed. And that would that would cause the student to be eligible to receive special education services. So uh, those those two things can you know a student can like dyslexia is a is a good example. A student who's who is uh, struggling with dyslexia who's been identified as a student with dyslexia dyslexia can be served under 504, but can also be served under special education. So the the need is determined, how would I say that? Well, for, for 504, it's mostly about access. Yeah. So if a student has a disability, but it doesn't rise to the level of needing specialized instruction or services, then that student would, would, would fit the 504 criteria for needing access to the general education classroom. So that could be a student with a hearing impairment that doesn't need special ed instruction, but needs equipment so that they can access their um, their general ed curriculum. It rises to special ed when you need services. So if that same hearing impaired child needed services from an auditory impairment teacher or needed services from a uh, speech language pathologist, that's the difference. So 504 is just giving access and most of that is done through uh, accommodation. So we would accommodate for the child's needs in the classroom. Dyslexia is is a different uh, is different because we do have a dyslexia specialist who works with with gen ed students, works with 504 students and special ed students. So again, that that need for additional specialized instruction would be that determination whether can we serve the student under 504? Do we need to serve the student under special ed? Does that answer the question that you had, <laughs> I hope. Yes, yeah. Um, and so if someone needs to speak to the 504 coordinator, do they just call the campus and ask? Do they, is that? In, in Snyder ISD, typically the 504 coordinator is one of the administrators on the campus. So uh, you could call the, the main office and just simply ask for, hey, can I speak with the 504 coordinator? A lot of our 504 parents are going to be familiar with those people because they meet with them every year. Uh, the administrator has been involved in helping develop that plan. So they probably are familiar with that individual to begin with. But yes, if, if you did not know who that was, you could simply, well, you could call the special services office and ask us, hey, my student is at the primary school. Who do I need to contact for 504? And we could help direct that, but you could certainly call the campus and just ask for the 504 coordinator it's typically going to be one of the administrators. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, next question is, um, how often will my child be tested once he or she is in special education services? So we're required uh, by law, by federal law, um, Special education is governed by Individuals with uh, Disabilities Education Act. And we, you will hear us say IDEA all the time. That's what that means. That's the law that governs special education. Um, and we are required by law to at least um, request or to evaluate your child every three years. So um, as an ARD committee, we have to address the evaluation at least triannually. Um, the other thing that you need to know is that we can also um, request additional testing as an ARD committee. So if we have a student who is in um, 
let's say they're in uh, special ed because they have a specific learning disability, but then we start noticing that they have um, some anxiety or some other things that we need to come back and do some more uh, uh, testing to evaluate whether or not they need additional support and services, then at any ARD, the parent or the school district can request that uh, additional testing be done. Now, that's an ARD committee decision. If a parent, a parent has the right to request additional testing at any time, just like they can ask for an ARD meeting at any time, but um, that is an ARD committee decision that the entirety of the ARD committee uh, has to agree on that that additional testing needs to be done. Okay. Um, what does least restrictive environment mean? Least restrictive environment, and again, um, there's a question later on that says, what's the deal with all of these acronyms? Um, <laughs> uh, we're really bad in special ed about just throwing around these acronyms. So you will hear people talk about LRE and that they're talking about least restrictive environment. And that basically means, again, IDEA, the law, requires that we address least restrictive environment. And that means we have to make sure that your child is in the general ed uh, environment with their typical peers as much as they are able to be there. So if a child can be in a regular ed English language arts class with inclusion support, then that's least restrictive environment. However, if their disability means that they need self-contained um, support, they need to be pulled out for resource for English language arts, then that would still be the least restrictive environment but we did have to address whether or not general ed could serve that child with supports. Um, and then we have to, as a committee decide, hey, that's not enough support, we have to do something else. So we always have to look at the general ed environment first. And can you explain the difference between resource and inclusion services? Mm -hmm. Inclusion services um, are services provided by our special education staff could be a special education teacher or a special education paraprofessional who goes, it, we call it pushing in, they push into a class um, and they are there to provide support for the student in the general ed classroom. So um, if a student needs help with um, getting their assignments written down in their assignment notebook or a child needs um, to have someone read the test for them or any other kind of assistance or have something re-explained to them, that's what inclusion is in the general ed classroom. Resource is that kind of that same service, but the student typically is not functioning or, or learning on grade level. So they have to be pulled out to a self-contained environment, typically the special education classroom, um, so that they can get more specialized instruction um, to reach their goals um, because they're working at a lower level, um, grade level. Okay, thank you. And one more term, what is a related service? Related services, you cannot get a related service in special education unless you qualify for special education under one of the 13 uh, qualifying conditions, and I won't go through all 13. So let's just say you, you meet eligibility as a student with an emotional disturbance. Um, a related service for that would be counseling services or psychological services. If you're a student who is... Um, auditorily impaired, a related service is uh, audiological services to help with your hearing aids and your FM equipment. So a related service is any service that is related to your disability that helps you access your general ed environment. Okay, thank you. Um, what if someone thinks their child might need or benefit from special education services? What should they do? I think, the, again, this kind of goes back to the, the original question that I started out with. I think the first step is, is to schedule a parent-teacher conference, visit with the parent, uh, address, you know, be, make sure that, that we are all on the same page with regards to the struggles that the student may be having. Because, uh, again, it, it may be something as simple as moving the kid closer to a computer screen so that they can see or hear better. Um, uh, Sometimes there are very easy fixes that, that help alleviate the, the challenges the student's having. But that's, that would be the first step is just having that parent-teacher conference, identifying the, the challenges that the parent is seeing that the child is having. Talk to the, the educator. Hey, what are you seeing in the classroom? 
uh, how are how are the grades? How are the how's his, how is my child's uh, academic uh, effort? I mean, you 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 just have all kinds of uh, questions that you can pose and answer and try to drill down and identify what the problem is. The parent, the, the teacher often too is going to be seeing those things and, and already uh, have identified some of the challenges that are going on. And ideally, the, it is the school district. It is, I mean, we are the educational experts. So it is, it, ideally it is us who are identifying those issues way before a parent has to come and say, hey, I think something's going on with my child. Uh, so, and, and it is my hope <laughs> that, that we are communicating with the parent long before they ever came to us and said, hey, I think something's going on. Uh, but it happens. There are occasions where uh, you miss it and the parent is the one who's, who's coming to the school and saying, hey, I feel like something's out of uh, place here. But the second step would be to, to have that conversation with an administrator. And then we typically we do a referral packet and won't you touch on that process. Well, I want to kind of uh, go off of what Matt said, um, that um, special education is very important and it is an option. It is not an option. It is what some students need. However, I want to make sure that parents understand that there are a lot of things um, that can be put into place to help a child in the general ed environment before we ever get to special education. So, um, I say that to say a parent has the right under IDEA to request a special ed evaluation at any time. So if they write it in writing and give it to an administrator on campus, they, that, that is kind of an initial, it process. starts the process. So a parent can ask for evaluation at any time. However, I would really um, encourage parents to work with the teachers and the administration on the campus to make sure that we have done the everything we can do, due diligence in the general ed environment in the classroom, and that we've also done the uh, RTI, which stands for Response to Intervention. It's a three-tiered process um, that works with students who are not progressing and who are struggling in the general ed environment. Um, let's work with the campus to make sure that that RTI process um, has been done with integrity and fidelity um, to see because there's a lot of times that kids don't respond in tier one, they get to tier two and they start having some help from an instructional coach and they push in and that's all the kid needed was just a little bit of additional support and, a, and maybe an accommodation or two. And here's the, here's the great thing. You don't have to be 504 or SPED to get accommodations. You can get accommodations in the general ed environment. Um, so um, once that's done, though, if a parent has gone through that process, they've talked to the teacher, they've talked to the administrator, and they still feel like their child is not making progress, then they would request an, a special ed evaluation in writing, and they need to, you know, put in writing what they're asking for, and they need to give it to an administrator on the campus. Um, in the past, a lot of times, um, what's happened is that that note gets lost in translation because it's given to a teacher or it's given to um, somebody in the drive through lane here. Can you give this to somebody? Um, so I would really encourage parents, give it to an administrator because then that way the, the referral process can start and be done uh, in a timely manner. And if possible, you know, you, you, again, I'm encouraging parents to, to collaborate with, with the educators as much as possible. Schedule a meeting with the administrator, sit down with them, have the conversation, hand them the letter right then and there. <laughs> that is that is the best way to make sure that, that the letter gets to the right person and we can get that process started. Great, good answers. Um, that's helpful, um, hopefully. And just wanna remind you all, if you have any questions, please type them in the chat or the Q&A. Uh, I have a few more here, but I just wanna remind you um, if you will put those in there and we haven't touched on something you have a question about, please let us know and we'll be sure to address that. Um, now we talked about the ARDS a little bit. Can you tell me um, what can be said in an ARD and who all needs to come to an ARD meeting? So uh, there are required members that by law have to be there. We have to have a, a campus administrator, a general ed teacher, 
typically someone who, who has worked with the student and, and knows the student, we have to have a special education teacher uh, who has specialized instruction and, and ability to address uh, uh, you know, the, the conversation from that angle. Any related service? Well, assessment personnel have to be there. So you either have to have a diagnostician or a, a speech language pathologist there. Or LSSP, mm -hmm. which is a, a licensed specialist in school psychology. So there's a number of assessment personnel who can serve in that position. Um, and then the other, if your child is, it can go off in a lot of tangents, but if your child is auditorily impaired or visually impaired, it's required by law that an AI or VI certified teacher has to be there. And that's really the only like required people that you have to be there. Um, but other people can be invited um, based on your students' needs. So if a child has related services, if they receive occupational therapy, then the OT might be um, requested to be there so that they can review any evaluation that they've done or any progress or any concerns that they have. Um, and so if, if the parent doesn't speak English or doesn't speak it well, our good friend Jesus sometimes sets in and he interprets for us. So that's another uh, person who can sit in. The parent can invite whoever they want. The parent can have, uh, uh, we've had parents bring siblings of the, the student in question, uh, uncles, friends, doctors, <laughs> whoever they want. They can, they can let us know, hey, we're gonna bring this person and they can, they can be in attendance. Um, that, that's true. The parent can bring anybody they would like to to the meeting. However, um, the parent just, so you know, the district will ask you to sign a confidentiality waiver so that anything that we, we share that's confidential, what the district is protected that we have the parents permission to have shared that confidential information. Um, but uh, the parent has to be there. One thing um, that people may not be aware of, when, when your child turns 18, um, we do what's called a transfer of rights. And that means that the rights that used to belong to the parents now belong to the adult student. And the adult student is the one that has to attend the meeting. Parents will always be invited out of courtesy unless the adult student requests that they not be invited. Um, but just so you know, um, we had a special ed student, our oldest son was special ed, and um, we understand that process of transfer of rights. And it's, it's kind of hard to take when you've been the person making the decisions and, and, and coming to the meetings. And then all of a sudden, when your kid turns 17, they start talking about, hey, in a year, you're not gonna have you know, the same rights. So just be aware of that. So at 18, we start inviting the adult student um, to be uh, the legal representative of themselves. All right, that's and a that good point. A challenge. Yeah. That was a challenge, because our, our 18 year old still couldn't find his shoes in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> but he still may not be able to, he's 27. <laughs> right. Um, let's talk about IEP. That's, um, can you tell me what an IEP is? What does it stand for? Also, speaking of acronyms. I mentioned it earlier. It's, it's an individual, individualized, easy for me to say, individualized education plan. And basically the IEP is the roadmap for how we're going to support that student. Uh, we, we have done the assessments, we've kind of identified strengths and weaknesses, uh, we've gathered all the data that helps us build a plan that will support that student's academic opportunity and, and improve their outcomes, and, and that's the desire of the IEP. Uh, we, do you want to address progressing and how the IEP is? So um, if a student is in special education, they have what we call uh, goals and objectives, and that just tells us what they're working on for the next year. So um, as part of the IEP, parents will get progress on those goals. Um, at the same time, they get progress on the child's report card. So if you're on a six week calendar at the high school or junior high, you would get the progress on the goals at the same time uh, every six weeks and then nine weeks at the primary and intermediate campus. Um, the only other thing that you might, people may not understand is that if you're, especially if you're coming in from another state, they call ARD meetings IEP meetings. So you have the IEP, which is the plan, but you also have the IEP, which is the meeting. 
But of course, in Texas, we don't do anything that anybody else does. So in Texas, we call them ARD meetings, and that stands for admission, review, and dismissal. So if you come from out of state and you're like, I don't know what this ARD thing is they're talking about and why they're talking about it and what it is, it's the same thing as an IEP meeting. Just, you know, in Texas, we got to do everything different. And Valerie, uh, I don't know if there's a way for us to put a link, uh, show the website, but our, our uh, special services website on uh, the SnyderISD.net platform, it has uh, uh, tons of information about dyslexia. Uh, it has a page about response and intervention, has a section 504 page. And then under special education, there's a number of, of links there that kind of help uh, with all of this. And there's, it addresses the ARD committee. Uh, there are links on several of those pages that will take, take the viewer to uh, the legal framework website, which is uh, a state uh, run website, but there's a ton of legal information on the legal framework. And then we've added some uh, less legal uh, jargon We've got some easier to understand, easier to read links there as well that, that kind of talk about the ARD committee, uh, the, the, the point of an ARD committee, why, we're, why we meet, what we accomplish. And uh, there's, there's a, a number of valuable resources there if, if the parents, if we have the ability to show that link. Otherwise, I think you could just Google Snyder ISD special education and it'd probably, it'd probably pull you, uh, go to that link. There's good information on the website that addresses a lot of the stuff that we're talking about. Yes, and I just posted that link in the chat um, so you all can find it there, but you can also go to SnyderISD.net um, and then you will see um, a section that under the Explore tab, if you go there and under Departments, you'll see Special Programs and you can click on the plus sign there um, or you can just click on Special Programs and you can get to all the information that's, that's on the site there. Okay, I'm looking to see if we have any other questions. No other questions have come through. We've got about three minutes left. So if you have a question, go ahead and submit it. Valerie, there was a question that I saw somewhere. I don't know where it came up, but it's talking about how, how do you define progress? Um, and that's kind of one of those nebulous kind of squishy things that it's hard to define. Um, when we're talking about response to intervention, that can be any response. So let's say your child uh, takes the MAP test and they score a, a, a 160 on the math version, and then they take it again and they score a 165. That's progress. It may not look like progress, what you think it should look like. Um, it may not look like their peers progress, but we have to, we're not measuring necessarily our kids against other kids. We do that in some ways, but what we're looking at when we talk about progress is based on looking at that child in September and then looking at that kid again in November to see have they made progress in what they're able to do in math, social studies, science, and functional goals as well, but um, just mostly the, the core. So it, it could be that you look at, you know, you've got a fourth grader and a sixth grader and you think, okay, my fourth grader can't do what my sixth grader did when they were in fourth grade. Um, that may very well be true. Your fourth grader may be struggling and struggles more than your sixth grader, but that your child is making progress. And so if the child is making progress and catching up, then that's what we look at so that um, they may not qualify for special education because they are making that progress as slow as it may be. And if they're still concerned and about the progress their child is making, but they don't qualify for special education services, there's certainly many other opportunities where they can reach out to the, the teacher or the administrator at the campus and find out about tutoring opportunities and, and other programs that might be available. And we have instructional coaches. We have um, specialists on every campus that um, help students who are struggling um, there's, there's, there's a whole lot that is provided through the general ed um, environment that um, that's where we want. That's where we need to target kids. I mean, um, again, you almost should look at special education as um, almost like a trauma unit. Like it, you're not supposed to go into special ed and camp out for the rest of your educational career. It's supposed to be something that you go into 
um, not for all of our kids, but for our kids with specific learning disabilities. We want to provide the specialized instruction they need in order to progress and be able to return to the general ed environment. So um, it is our goal as a district to make sure that if our kids can be um, provided the services and the accommodations and the, the resources and supports they need to be successful in the gen ed environment, that's where we want them to stay. And we believe that every child uh, will learn and can achieve high standards given appropriate support. And so at all, all levels, staff uh, are responsible for every student. That's our, that's our commitment. Absolutely. And I think really the key message here is communication. If, if you're concerned about your child and you don't feel like they're getting what they need, please reach out to us. If you're not sure where to start, I mean, you can call the main office here at 574-8900 and we can direct you. You can email questions at Snyder ISD. You can look through the website and, and find us. Um, if, and we can certainly try to answer your questions or get you to who you need to speak with. Um, but if you're, if you're concerned, don't just stay frustrated, reach out to us and, and let us help you. Okay, well, it's 1230. Um, I don't see any other questions uh, that have come through, but if you think of something later, please don't hesitate to reach out and we will be glad to um, <clears throat> be glad to answer your questions. So thank you so much for joining us.